Hello. Let's talk about this SDL titled Acute Appendicitis and Peritonitis. The appendix is a blind-ended pouch. It's an outpouching of the cecum, which is the proximal most portion of the large bowel. It has a variant anatomy, and it's filled with a plethora of lymphocytes, namely B cells, arranged in follicular patterns. And the presence of follicular B cells in the appendix has led us to believe that it functions in the intestines similarly to how your tonsils do in your pharynx. Which is to say that B cells get produced in the appendix, they multiply there, and then they disperse elsewhere throughout the GI tract to provide it with a constant source of cell-mediated immunity. B cells, importantly, produce immunoglobulin A, which is a soluble dimer. And the reason why it's important that it's soluble is because that means IgA can get into the lumen of the gut. It can uh, dissolve in fluid out into the lumen of the gut, and it can bind to antigens before they even make it into your body. So that's very beneficial. And then uh, it's a dimer, so that means it's got four possible binding sites for antigen rather than uh, two as all other immunoglobulins barring IgM only have two. So plasma cells, B cells, uh, secrete immunoglobulin A and that's the important function of the appendix. Appendicitis is inflammation of the appendix. And this inflammation is mediated by a common instigation of appendiceal obstruction. So because the appendix is a blind-ended pouch, if you were to block off the entrance to the pouch, if you were to roll a rock in front of the entrance to this cave, well, all of the glandular cells within the appendix are still producing their normal product. And so when you block off the entryway, the only entryway to this blind-ended cul-de-sac, and it keeps producing mucin, well, it will swell and swell and swell and eventually all of the fluid edema means that cellular waste metabolites are just cooling um, and you factor in the, the pressure that the contents of the pouch are exerting on the walls and the microvasculature in the region and obstruction of the appendix can very quickly lead to ischemic necrosis of the appendix. So when this happens, you have to take the appendix out it's a surgical emergency because if you just have unbridled necrosis down in your right lower quadrant, well, there are other organs in the area that could very quickly become impacted by the spread of necrosis and particularly infection if it's an infection involved. And that would be like your large gut, your reproductive organs, your ureters. Uh, those could all be involved in the case of a peritonitis evolving out of a appendicitis. So there are many causes of appendiceal obstruction, four big ones, infections, fecalits, gallstones, that's rare, and also cancer. An infection constitutes the majority of appendiceal obstructions. And it can be just the bug, the microbe, that's uh, proliferated enough to be blocking up the appendix, or it can be the immune reaction against the pathogen that's blocking up the appendix, and that's called a lymphoid hyperplasia. And you can picture that as, well, all those B cells in these germinal centers, as you would see here, if they recognize an infection, the first thing that they do is that they, they, they try to find a antibody, an, an immunoglobulin that is shaped uh, reciprocally to whatever antigens it's getting presented to it by the MHCs on an antigen presenting cell. And so when a B cell identifies the right shape of antibody against a particular antigen, it goes into what we call clonal proliferation and it just makes a million of itself. It copies and copies and replicates over and over again because it knows that you need a lot of that specific antibody. So whenever this replication occurs in the appendix because it has a small lumen to start with, well, that 
follicle of B cells can expand so drastically that it would essentially block off the remainder of the appendix distal to that swelling. And we've seen something analogous to this in Sjogren's syndrome very recently, in which you can get a xerostomia, a dry mouth, from lymphocytes obstructing the Stinson duct, your parotid duct. And so the same kind of mechanism is happening here. And incidentally, the lymphoid hyperplasia is why different viruses, particularly adenovirus, can get down into the GI tract, into the cecum, and cause, again, a multiplying of B cells in a manner that's going to obstruct the appendix. They're reacting to that pathogen. And you can get appendicitis in a kid from that. So step by step, what's the physiology behind it? Well, when you get an obstruction, as we said, it's going to gradually raise the pressure within the distal lumen of the appendix. And as we said, it's smaller than the normal GI tract to start with. Proximal obstruction by any number of initiating factors leads to ongoing mucus secretion. So as we said again, you've got goblet cells down in your intestine because it's got the same histology, or I'm sorry, you've got goblet cells all throughout your intestine, but even in your appendix, you've still got goblet cells and it's got the same histology as the large bowel. So you're making mucus secretions in your appendix along with all those B cells. And if you block off the appendix, the mucus can't go anywhere, so the appendix blows up like a balloon, it distends, and the pressures within the appendix get very high, and your microvasculature doesn't like that, and your nervous system innervating your appendix doesn't like that, and so appendicitis starts off with uh, general vague periumbilical pain, the T8 through T10 dermatomes, T10 is the umbilicus, remember, uh, so you start general and then you go into a more specific right lower quadrant pain as the peritoneum gets involved. And so that's where we're going next is the development of peritonitis or at the very least peritoneal irritation from appendicitis. And as that balloon-like appendix keeps getting blown up bigger because of the obstruction, you see mucosal ischemia, which is a weakness of the wall. And that thinning of the wall can lead to ulceration and eventually perforation of the appendix. And so the swelling of the appendix can also press up against the peritoneum. And remember that your peritoneum is essentially a serous lined cavity similar to the pericardium. Um, and so it's got a lot of free nerve endings inside it and it's also highly vascularized. So if anything, pushes up and irritates that peritoneum, you're going to know it and you're going to know exactly where it is. And so that inflammation of the appendix that bumps up against the peritoneum eventually because it gets so swollen and inflamed, that contact with the peritoneum is going to be what causes the localized right lower quadrant pain. So back to the micro level, again, ischemia, uh, it means that you can't get rid of waste products. And so eventually you're just surrounded by protons and that acidity leads your mitochondria to stop functioning. Uh, and then you're going to see this massive influx of cellular calcium as you can't uh, run your ATP pumps anymore. And that's what leads to cell apoptosis or necrosis if it doesn't have the energy to commit apoptosis. And so when that happens to a larger swath of tissue, then you can develop an ulcer and there will be neutrophils investing within that necrotic tissue to attempt to clean up the damage in macrophages too. And then point three here is explaining how the inflammation can progress all the way through the thickness of the wall of the appendix leading to perforation, which can directly contribute to a peritonitis, inflammation of the peritoneum, or if it's infected, the development of an abscess in that region. And all this is happening within about a three-day time span. So that's why appendix, appendicitis is considered surgical emergency, again, is because if you don't take this out, then you very, very quickly got a much bigger problem on your hands than just appendicitis. Lots of bacteria can cause appendicitis. And even if it's non-bacterial in origin, 
Once all that ischemic tissue starts building up, well, ischemic tissue can't fend for itself. It can't really fight off pathogens. That's not its uh, top priority. Its top priority is just staying alive. And so also in an ischemic area, it's going to be uh, more difficult for your immune cells to uh, extravasate into that damaged tissue to try to clean things up because they don't want to go in there. It's ischemic. It's dead. Uh, so ischemic tissue is weaker than healthy, normal tissue. And because it's generally weaker, it's more prone to bacterial colonization. Common in infections, E. coli is number one. Anaerobes. Bacterioides can give you an abscess and appendicitis. Pseudomonas sometimes, and strep pneumonia is common in kids. So let's walk through the timeline of appendicitis early on. So you've got your obstruction. Again, number one, we're starting with an obstruction. Go ahead and write that out. So you have your obstruction, and again, that could be reactive lymphoid hyperplasia due to an infection. Could be a fecal if, uh, indigestible stone of stool. What else did we say it could be? It could be cancer, it could be a, a blood cell cancer like a lymphoma or a leukemia. And then we also said gallstones could uh, get dislodged or spit out that uh, major ampulla and it can make its way all the way down the GI tract and get lodged in the appendix. So any different mechanism for obstruction can give you early stage appendicitis characterized by hypoxia, then ischemia, and necrosis, and ulceration, and following ulceration, bacterial infection. So you'll see a lot of neutrophils at this point in the histopathology, and as you continue on into the span of multiple days, then you'll start to see macrophages and lymphocytes or more chronic immune response. So after that initi initial uh, edema and ulceration, you start to see the superative appendicitis and superative basically means that all the neutrophils that you sent into this damaged region died. And so when they died, they left behind a lot of pus because neutrophils contain lytic enzymes that just melt everything around them. And that's where you get the pus, the superative appearance from. And then Alongside with that comes a fibrinous exudate, which is basically a reactive scarring mediated by the surrounding tissues that are still there. Uh, they'll throw down collagen and fibrin particularly to try to mediate the damage and patch everything up and keep it contained. And so here's a big point. If the inflamed serosa of the appendix comes into contact with the parietal peritoneum, patients typically experience the classic shift of pain from the periumbilicus to the right lower abdominal quadrant which is continuous and more severe than the early visceral pain. And again, that's because there are so many nerves in the peritoneum that will tell you exactly where it's being agitated. So from that superative appendicitis point, uh, we then on page five start talking about kind of different branching pathways that appendicitis can take. Uh, it could turn gangrenous and anytime you see gangrene, think just black, purely necrotic, uh, with a lot of hemorrhaged red blood cells leading to some coagulation. Perforated appendicitis, again, it may perforate and spill out into the rest of the abdominal cavity, and that's going to cause a peritonitis, inflammation of the peritoneum. You could see an abscess too, and again, just because you have a perforation doesn't mean you can't have an abscess. So if patient symptoms continued even after you took the appendix out, that's a good indication to get another CT and see if there's an abscess down there. It could spontaneously resolve. The patient could have acute right lower quadrant pain, and then it just kind of goes away. And uh, that's more common if it's a lymphoid hyperplasia, as we were saying, against maybe a viral infection. And let's say that those B cells take care of the virus, and they're like, okay, we don't need to be here anymore. Job's done. Good work, guys. And so the, the big lymphoid follicle that's blocking the entrance to the appendix will just dissolve. Recurrent appendicitis, uh, one out of 10 patients, again, they're going to see like uh, uh, sentinel or warning sign symptoms, and then eventually, bang, they do get acute appendicitis. 
And then chronic appendicitis is very, very rare and it's characterized as you would expect histologically by chronic infiltrate such as lymphocytes and a large degree of fibrosis indicating that the scarring has gone on for some time. So at the bottom of page five, we start talking about the pathology of appendicitis. And again, uh, the number one finding grossly and histologically is going to be scarring and how that might be put to you in a question stem is fibrinous exudate. And it's uh, because of all the neutrophils, the neutrophil response, they, they degranulate, they spit their enzymes out, they do their reactive oxygen species mediated killing, and that damages surrounding cells. And when cells are damaged, they'll spit out collagen and fibrin again to try to contain that damage and to hold themselves together. A fecalith may be evident that is pictured in the right lower image of these four here, uh, just pair of tweezers holding a fecalith. So be able to recognize that uh, grossly. Other than that, fecalith, appendicitis looks pretty similar, pretty uniform across all appendices. Um, again, the gut is the gut's typically covered by a serosal surface that has a shine or a sheen or a shimmering uh, kind of moist appearance to it. But in the case of uh, appendicitis, due to the fibrinous exudate and scarring, it starts to look a little bit more dried up. Uh, and then you can also see increased wall thickness that's a big old wall right there, that appendix, right? Not much of a lumen in that thing at all. And it's a direct result of the fibrosis, which is your body's attempt to heal itself in the face of inflammation. So let's talk about the patient with appendicitis. How do they present? Uh, something I want to mention quickly is that you can get a pseudo appendicitis from a particular bacteria. Do you remember what bacteria can give you right lower quadrant pain, especially in kids too? And that's, that would be your cinea intercoliticus most commonly. Uh, other things that would be on your differential for appendicitis are going to be uh, things like maybe a, a ruptured ovarian cyst and polycystic ovarian disease. Um, maybe something like an ectopic pregnancy in the right ovary um, because that's kind of right behind where the appendix would sit. So it's going to be generalized inflammation that gets more specific as more and more of the peritoneum is involved. Fever related symptoms pop up later in the course of the illness. Might see nausea and vomiting, but mostly it's just point tenderness, like literally, hey doc, it's right here. And again, fever if it's bad. So then something that this SDL does that I particularly love is it gives us some uh, some clinical diagnostic tools. And it starts by talking about the McBurney point, which is, quote, located two thirds of the distance from the umbilicus to the right ASIS. And so that's where the patient's going to have point tenderness in the case of appendicitis. Uh, here's a image of it. It's this dot labeled one right there. And then as you can see, two thirds of the way from the umbilicus to the anterior superior iliac spine. And if you palpate there, the patient's gonna be guarded. They're gonna be really, really tight. Their muscles won't wanna relax. And it's because of all the inflammation immediately underneath deep to that point. Another cool mention within the text is that the patient often assumes the fetal position or lies with their right leg flexed up at the hip. And again, that's guarding or, or a sort of unconscious protective mechanism to stop anything whatsoever from coming close to touching that tender spot, the burning point. Physical exam findings, reiterating what's above, involvement of the Peritoneum is what causes the localized tenderness because there are a lot of nerves in your peritoneum. And it's going to present at McBurney point typically. There's some variation in the anatomy of the appendix, specifically uh, what direction it's branching off of the cecum, right? But classically, it's McBurney point, which means that nine out of 10 board style questions are going to give you McBurney point. 
again, this is a quick disease. It's a fulminant infection or inflammation. You start seeing symptoms about a half day after the initial obstruction and perforation can occur around the two to three to four day mark. And perforation is a terrible complication, but I don't think these patients will have any question about going in to see a doctor. You know, it's going to be hurting so bad. It says again, you quite often see a fever. So that's symptom number two, kind of besides the pain. Upon physical exam, you're going to see abdominal guarding, which is contraction of the muscles when a hand is pressing the abdomen during physical exam. You're also going to see rebound tenderness, and you need to know what rebound tenderness is. It's pain whenever, so you press the abdomen, and it kind of hurts, but then it's like, oh, okay, it's going away. But then you take your hand off, and you stop pressing as hard, and they're like, ah, oh, that hurts. So that's rebound tenderness. Abdominal rigidity, check. A couple of accessory signs. This is not going to be like, what the question is based upon, but some of these accessory signs might be one of the little clues that they weave into a question stem to let you know, hey, think appendicitis. And one of those is the Rob Singh sign, which is right lower quadrant pain with palpation of the left lower quadrant. So this is an example of referred pain. And here is an image of where you would palpate in order to elicit a positive Robsing sign. You would essentially go near the ASIS on the other side of the body, the left side of the body. And then if they feel pain on the right lower quadrant where you traditionally suspect appendicitis, that's a positive Robsing sign. We've also got the obturator sign. Right lower quadrant pain with internal and external rotation of the flexed right hip. So what does that look like? You lay the patient down, you get them to flex their hip, you got their knee, 90 degree flexion, and you're just going to crank it and work it and uh, have them resist. And if they have a lot of pain with that motion, then you're like, okay, well, the appendicitis, uh, the patient's appendix anatomically is going to be a little bit deeper inside the hemipelvis and it's going to be angled down. And then you've got a psoas sign, which is, again, just uh, if you see it's positive, think appendicitis. Uh, and the only real differential for a positive psoas sign is the psoas abscess, which is typically going to be anaerobic bacteria. And I suppose you could get a psoas abscess with a perforated appendix as well. So this might be a useful follow-up test if patient comes back to your office three days after having the appendectomy. And I don't think I have a picture for that one but you should remember that the psoas muscles, you got a major and a minor and they attach proximally to your spinal column and then uh, distally to your femur and their hip flexors. So lab studies, this is a big finding. 80% of patients have a left shift leukocytosis. Two things. Number one, they have too many neutrophils. They have a surplus of neutrophils. They're over the top. Number two, these neutrophils are baby neutrophils. And remember, neutrophils are polymorphonuclear sites. And so you can kind of estimate the age of the neutrophils that you see on a smear uh, based on the number of nuclei that they have, much like rings on a tree. And so we mentioned that with a B12 deficiency anemia, those uh, white blood cells have to stay in the blood for a very long time because you're unable to make a lot of them. And so they end up with uh, uh, very many nuclei uh, they're, they're old. They'll have like six or seven or eight different nuclei. And so that would be like a lot of rings on a tree. But in a left shift, what that means is you're seeing little saplings. You're seeing little baby neutrophils with one or two nuclei. And that's because you are, in the case of an appendicitis or any other infection in which you see a left shift, you're throwing lots of neutrophils at the infected territory and they're dying. Kind of like, uh, I don't know, clash of clans, like when you just buy nothing but barbarians and they all cost like one energy a piece. And so you just buy like a hundred of them and you send them all at a wall and they all just get shredded like that, you know, by the turrets. And it's like, that's your neutrophils in the face of a bad appendicitis. And so you have to make new neutrophils and throw more neutrophils at it. Cause what are you going to do? Not throw any neutrophils at it. And so in order to do that, you push neutrophils out of the bone marrow where they mature before they're ready. And so they're young. And so that's why you see premature neutrophils with 
few nuclei on a blood smear. So the first test, best test, really the only test you need in some cases for appendicitis, CBC with differential. Imaging, uh, x-ray doesn't work, x-ray not helpful, don't get an x-ray, get an abdominal CT. Complications, perforations are number one, which lead directly into peritonitis, which we'll talk about in a minute. The time interval between onset of symptoms and rupture of the appendix is about 36 to 72 hours. A perforated appendix must be considered in a patient with a fever, with leukocytosis, and with fluid collection in the right lower quadrant. So you could see that on CT, or if it were particularly bad enough, you might even be able to palpate that and realize that compared to the left side, that right side had more fluid, maybe a edema. And you'd probably be an exudate in the setting of an appendicitis, not a transidate because of the infection going on there. So it wouldn't pit. But overall, if you catch appendicitis early enough and you take the appendix out, really low mortality rate. You just got to get it before that complication of a perforation. And when in doubt, cut it out. So that's appendicitis. We mentioned that a tumor of the appendix may obstruct the lumen proximally of the appendix and create an appendicitis. So besides your white blood cell tumors, here are a couple of primary appendiceal tumors that might be able to do so. The most common, 80%, are neuroendocrine tumors, formerly called carcinoid tumors. And the remaining 20% of primary appendiceal neoplasms are going to be mucinous in nature. Because again, the appendix looks like your large intestine, so both tissues have a lot of goblet cells and secrete a lot of mucus to keep things well lubricated to keep stool moving along. Let's talk first about neuroendocrine tumors. These are the ones that are yellowish, tannish in appearance, cream colored. They tend to grow in the distal appendix, so they wouldn't obstruct if they were at the very tip of the appendix, but then they would if they were at the opening of the appendix. These neuroendocrine tumors secrete histamine. They secrete peptide hormones, particularly serotonin. And because they have a neural component, they stain for chromogranin A and synaptophysin. It's important to know that appendiceal neuroendocrine tumors very rarely metastasize, and they don't metastasize because they don't get big enough to metastasize. Normally about the two centimeter mark is when a tumor starts to get really invasive, you know, like uh, it's, it's firing on all cylinders proverbially. But due to that narrow lumen of the appendix, it's, it's a skinny organ to start with. It is kind of hard for a tumor to grow two centimeters into the lumen of an already skinny appendix. So if you do see liver mets and they let you know it's a serotonin syndrome type carcinoid tumor and they say, where's the primary tumor most likely? Well, number one most likely is gonna be your small bowel intestinal carcinoid tumors. Now we discuss epithelial tumors of the appendix. Right off the bat, at the bottom of this section, it says they're often positive for mutations in KRAS, GNAS, and P53. Uh, GNAS, I recognize that from uh, oh, McCoon Albright, in which you see uh, what's it going to be? One sided cafe au lait macules. And that's your G protein alpha subunit. Benign epithelial tumors include adenomas, so benign glandular tumors and serrated polyps, which is discussed in a previous SDL, and they're serrated because they have a sawtooth outer appearance. And the appendicular adenomas, kind of like a colorectal adenoma, can have a villus or a tubular appearance. And remember that out of the two of those, villus is worse prognostically. Villus is the villain, the bad guy. But what you really think you might get tested on for this SDL are malignant tumors of the appendix, all of epithelial origin, because there's six or seven of them. Good news is they only go into detail about a couple of them. 
The first one being this low-grade appendiceal mucinous neoplasm, or LAMN. It produces abundant mucin, and so one of the most common presenting symptoms of this, if not appendicitis, is going to be stools that are uh, stools that have snot in them. Basically, that's what I'm thinking of, uh, and I'm not going to show you a picture of that. And appendiceal mucosa in the setting of this LAMN is going to undergo papillary or villus adenomatous change. And finally, the histology reveals epithelial cells with basally oriented uniform small darkly stained nuclei. So before we read anything else about that, let's check out a quick picture too. Here's your low grade appendiceal mucinous neoplasm. Here are just cystic poolings of mucin. These are mucinous spaces. And you can start to see, I'll put in yellow, some slight villus differentiation within this tissue of the appendix. So if you get one of these uh, sections and it's in the appendix, you're like, oh, I'm starting to see villus changes. That should not be in the appendix. It should not have any villi at all. It's here on the right. Oh, villus. Yeah, particularly villainous. Um, so it's got mucosal changes associated with it. And you can see the mucus still inside the gland or all, all the glands, the glandular architecture of this tumor. It's this stuff that's kind of like gray in color and just, again, looks like maybe phlegm or something. Uh, and it's in between cells and it's pretty acellular. So everything I'm highlighting in green is just extracellular mucin. Um, so if you did not see all that mucin, you'd probably be rolling with just a uh, benign villus adenoma. And here's a papillary example of a low-grade appendiceal mucinous neoplasm. Lots of goblet cells, um, because again, it looks just like the small intestine. Um, so you're gonna see a lot of, or the large intestine, so you'll see a lot of goblet cells on the outside there, but typically you wouldn't see this many goblet cells. There's just a ton of them here. And so this is low-grade because the tissue does look relatively normal and this, photo shows us precisely what those epithelial cells with basally oriented uniform small darkly stained nuclei look like because it's like okay um if if this is the outside of the cell with green and if this is the inside of the cell that we highlight in yellow well then the yellow is highlighting the basal layer and the green is highlighting the apical side. And that's the terminology we use whenever we're talking about a polar cell. And so you are seeing dark, round, small nuclei clustered along the basal side of the epithelial cell. So it's not particularly memorable, but at least you've now seen it once. Uh, you could have pushing, that's like a broad, kind of an undulated slight curvature appearance down downwards deep into the submucosa beneath and the lamina propria because um, it is an epithelial cell tumor. And then uh, what you want to know test question wise is what's the complication? Uh, number one is going to be pseudomyxoma peritoni and number two is going to be acute appendicitis. Actually, I'd probably say number one is going to be acute appendicitis because it says 70% of patients with this tumor eventually do get the appendicitis. So that's the low grade. Then at the bottom of page 10, we talk about the high grade appendiceal mucinous neoplasms. And very similar, just a little bit more messed up. Uh, if you zoom in on the nuclei, you might be able to observe uh, dysplasia and nuclear changes, maybe some mitotic figures, and definitely a high degree of atypia. I couldn't find any good histology images of a particularly high grade HAMN on the internet. So I don't have any images for those. A mucinous adenocarcinoma of the appendix. It's also high grade. So cytologic atypia. So use your best judgment when you're looking at a photo on test and look at the nuclei and see, do you see any cariorexis, cariolysis? Is there fragmentation of the nucleus? Are they pycnotic? Are they shrinking? Um, do you see mitotic figures in many cells? Because if you do, that's uh, you should be thinking high grade there. A de-differentiated tumor. And histologically with this mucinous adenocarcinoma, you're seeing cells surrounded by an abundance of mucin as if floating in pools of mucin. Uh, 
And again, the big complication there is pseudomyxoma peritoni. Peritoni I probably. Uh, peritoni sounds like pepperoni. And so an example of the mucinous changes, again, we highlighted just extracellular mucin in green on the right-hand side of this slide. So again, you can tell that that's an extracellular arch uh, architectural feature. You can tell that that's not individual cells down in there. That's a product of the glandular cells nearby. That's mucin. So then your mucinous adenocarcinoma could have signet ring cells in it. And if it is, you call it a mucinous adenocarcinoma with signet ring cells. So there's no picture of either of those two within, within this SDL. So I don't think that actually there is, here's one picture of a mucinous adenocarcinoma, but it, it looks so similar to all these other different tumors. Um, just remember, you're going to see tons of mucin lakes. Although, I mean, all these dudes have mucin in them. So it's like, that's kind of, that's going to be a frustrating question if we get that. Non-mucinous adenocarcinoma. What do you need to know about it? You don't see extracellular mucin. It's an adenocarcinoma, so it's of glandular origin. Uh, you do see malignant-looking glands with atypia. The cancerous cell is a columnar cell. And appendiceal adenoma and serrated polyp are the precursors of the non-mucinous adenocarcinoma. So serrated polyp, you should be able to recognize that. Presents as appendicitis. Uh, most common pattern of metastasis is to the liver or lung hematogenously. And carcinoembryonic antigens positive in them. So I hope we don't get asked the metastatic question either because this is the only, this non-mucinous adenocarcinoma is the only one that points out, oh, hey, it's going to hematogenously metastasize. But for all of the tumors that have an increased risk of appendicitis, I would say that the most common metastasis is going to be uh, intraperitoneal seeding, as made evident by that pseudomyxoma peritonei. Remember, there's just different groups of metastasis. So when you're reviewing this text one more time, if it's associated with appendicitis, number one root seeding, body cavity seeding of the peritoneum. If it's not, number one root is going to be hematogenously, the liver and lungs. We talk about a goblet cell carcinoma quickly. Mixed tumors means that they've got uh, two cancerous cell lineages within them. And in the case of a goblet cell carcinoma, it's number one, the goblet cell, and number two, neuroendocrine cells. And we think that these tumors arise from multipotent stem cells, and some of them go the goblet cell route, and some of them go the neuroendocrine route. And so because they have that neural part, they will stain positive for chromogranin A and synaptophysin. I've got a photo of a goblet cell carcinoma, and this one is pretty friendly. I really hope that we get asked this one because, I mean, there are some goblet cells. There are some goblet cells. There are some goblet cells. And then all these little red patches that you see uh, interspersed throughout, I'll highlight them, like that, that dude, that dude. Uh, they're indicating granules within the cytoplasm of neuroendocrine cells. So that's a pretty easy tumor to recognize. Here's another example. Again, you've got goblet cells interspersed, goblet cells, goblet cells down there, goblet cells in the middle, and then they're surrounded by these small eosinophilic, or I'm sorry, basophilic type cells that look like they've got a lot of zymogen granules within them. They look like neurosecretory cells. They're small, purple, and round. And so that's the nice and easy goblet cell carcinoma. And we keep bringing up pseudomyxoma peritonei. So here's what that looks like. This thing is so messed up, yo. It's way different than any of these other tumors that we're looking at. It's barely got any architecture at all to it. It's just a, a huge abundance of mucin. So all four of these pictures, really give you a good look of what extracellular mucin looks like once more. And that mucin is going to get into the peritoneal cavity secondary to a mucinous neoplasia. Um, typically the LAMN and the mucinous adenocarcinoma, which cause appendicitis, and then there's a perforation and that's how the tumor gets out. 
I can see that very easily. And the tumor cells are not too sticky, so they do tend to drain downwards into the pouch of Douglas, which is uh, right next to the rectoanal portion of the large intestine. Uh, the rectal vesicle pouch, again, this is something that uh, you would be able to palpate if you were to perform a manual examination of the rectum. And a uh, big presenting symptom of this pseudomyxoma peritonei is going to be mucinous ascites. Ascites is just a collection of fluid in the abdomen. And here at the very bottom is the text saying they tend to have KRAS genes most frequently, then GNAS after that, then TP53. That's it for the appendix. Let's discuss the peritoneum. The peritoneum is essentially a double-lined serous membrane. It's double-lined because it's got a visceral and a parietal peritoneum component with a thin layer of serous fluid in between. And the mesentery is what connects the peritoneum to particular organs. So if you ever hear of, for example, the mesocolon, well, what that's referring to is the strip of mesentery which is essentially an extension of the peritoneum, connecting the large bowel to the peritoneal cavity. So serous membranes are composed of a single layer of mesothelial cells, where we heard mesothelial cells before, mesothelioma. The main function of the mesothelium is to lubricate in between the two layers to allow for free movement of all of the organs and tissues within that peritoneal cavity that are wrapped up within the mesentery of the peritoneum. So if that sort of tissue gets infected or inflamed maybe by a perforation and spillage of bile acids, for example, you can get a peritonitis. The large majority of them are associated with an infection because um, even if it just starts off uh, with a, say an acid related, peptic ulcer related perforation, well, because of all the damage in the locality, it's not going to take very long for uh, an infectious pathogen to set up shop within that area. So we're going to call it a primary or a secondary peritonitis, and most of them are going to be secondary, meaning that you get the peritonitis after the primary insult of perforation, and it lists a couple of mechanisms of abdominal perforation, appendicitis, peptic ulcer disease, and diverticuli within the text here. And I want to remind you a couple more overlapping uh, perforatory causes, especially in right lower quadrant, are going to be ovarian cysts and ectopic pregnancies. So most cases of secondary peritonitis are polymicrobial, which means that when we're thinking about drug regimens, uh, we're probably going to have to throw the house at them. Because you don't know if it's going to be a gram negative or a gram positive, so it's going to have to be some strong drugs. Most common infectious agents within this chronic peritoneal dialysis are staph and strep. And again, the dialysis is associated with uh, contamination of medical instruments that are inserted into the peritoneal cavity, be it during a procedure or during a surgery. And then we talk about primary peritonitis. And we're going to call it a primary peritonitis if we can't find a hole in the gut, essentially, because perforation is the most, the usual suspect for how did this peritonitis get there. And SDL gives us two examples of primary peritonitis, and both of them are pretty noteworthy. Spontaneous bacterial peritonitis and TB peritonitis. So I figure you're getting a test question out of this section here. Let's talk about spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. This is peritonitis in the absence of an obvious source of contamination, meaning again, you can't find a perforation. It is an acidic fluid infection without an evident intra-abdominal surgically treatable source. It can occur as a complication of any disease state that produces the clinical syndrome of ascites, such as heart failure, and liver cirrhosis. So ascites is not just fluid in the gut, but fluid in the gut due to a transidate, 
I think I might have said, oh, this is an X day before. So that would be considered an ascites if it were just like a bunch of – never mind. I don't know what I'm saying there. All that I do know is that if you have heart failure or liver cirrhosis, you're going to get a transidate in the gut because you're going to have a very high hydrostatic pressure in the venous portal system of your GI tract. So in the case of heart failure, uh, you got too much preload because your heart can't pump it all out. So the preload backs up, right? It backs up down to the liver, through the liver, into the mesenteric veins, and the high pressure inside the mesenteric veins pushes fluid out into the extracellular space, outside the bloodstream. In the case of a cirrhosis, now your liver makes albumin, and albumin maintains your oncotic pressure or your osmotic pressure. The protein in your blood pulls water into the bloodstream. So if your liver is cirrhotic, you're not making a lot of protein. So water is more prone to diffuse in a transitative manner out of the bloodstream into the surrounding tissues where there's a lot of protein. So you can also get an infection that could induce ascites. And an example of that that I know of is Streptococcus uh, pyogenes or pneumonia. Streptococcal species can get into a kid's kidneys. I'm thinking pyogenes, definitely. Um, and it can give, your, give a child a nephrotic syndrome, which is going to be destruction of the glomerular unit, essentially, which would allow for protein to just filter out into the urine at an alarming rate. And this would lead to a hypoalbuminemia. And that hypoalbuminemia would cause ascites through the same exact mechanism as liver cirrhosis. A drop in protein in the bloodstream would allow fluid to diffuse elsewhere. And so that's an acquired, uh, non-chronic example of how you could just develop a peritonitis through the development of ascites induced by a bacteria. And then the bacteria would probably follow the water because many bacteria are very small and get pushed into the abdominal cavity, creating the peritonitis. So strep can do that in a kid. E. coli can do that in adults. And E. coli is the most common cause of spontaneous bacterial peritonitis, which is probably where they would be going with the question on our in-house exam. Then we have tuberculous peritonitis, which is, you guessed it, associated with mycobacterium tuberculosis, not the primary infection, but the reactivation of a latent focus in the peritoneum established from hematogenous spread from a lung TB infection, because primary TB is almost always in lung. A couple things increase your risk. Uh, anything that immunocompromises you certainly does. So it presents very similarly to TB with low-grade fever, night sweats, weight loss, anorexia, and malaise, uh, very similarly to how just about any TB is going to present. Uh, you're going to see a positive PPD. And if you were to look at the surface, the infected surface of the peritoneum, then it's going to have granular, nodular lesions on it, uh, very characteristic of mycobacterium tuberculosis. Chemical peritonitis results from the escape of bile or pancreatic secretions into the peritoneal cavity. So some sort of rupture or perforation of the small bowel could lead to all that uh, caustic bile, harmful bile being secreted into somewhere that can't tolerate it. And then pancreatic enzymes, obviously, oh, those things just shred everything that comes into contact with them. So the point of bringing that up is to remind you to keep a broad differential and get a CT for sure for peritonitis. And a peritoneal abscess. Well, we've brought up abscesses a couple times. Anytime you see abscess, you're thinking anaerobics. 
you're thinking high likelihood of polymicrobial infection. Um, and you're going to be using things like metronidazole, uh, maybe uh, clindamycin if it's an esophageal or upper gastric abscess. How does peritonitis present? I kind of wish they would have put this section number one. Abdominal pain, commonly with obstruction of the bowel. That's ileus, that's obstruction of the bowel. And you can see peritonitis following surgeries as a complication anytime you have to cut the gut open. There's a risk of infection involved there. Physical exam is gonna show you rebound tenderness again. You press down, kinda hurts, it fades away. You take your hand off, oh, now that really hurts. Involuntary guarding is a rock hard, rigid abdomen like mine. And in a lab study, you take a CBC, you're going to see leukocytosis, lots of white blood cells with a left shift, they're babies, so same thing as appendicitis. What's the pathology look like? Well, we already did reference what it'll look like again with appendicitis. Stuff that normally has a sheen to it, stuff that normally appears kind of moist because of the serous nature of the peritoneum is going to appear dry and fibrotic with the presence of a peritonitis because any inflammation causes cells to throw down fibrin and collagen. You could see a creamy purulent exudate. That's the neutrophil response and that's the neutrophils uh, liquefying everything around them. Uh, the volume of fluid varies enormously, but getting that fluid out is a priority if it stacks up. Exudate can create subhepatic and subdiaphragmatic abscesses. So abscesses everywhere. Common complication of peritonitis is the abscess. At the bottom of page 15 is mentioned idiopathic retroperitoneal fibrosis, which doesn't seem to be like that big of a deal for the purpose of our testing. Also called Ormond disease, also called sclerosing retroperitonitis, and it's specifically sclerosing around the ureters. And if you put the ureters in a box, basically, then it's hard for them to expand. So going to the bathroom is going to be a little bit more painful and difficult. And you could definitely see some backflow into the kidneys and some high pressure in the glomerular units. And this could give you some renal damage. And uh, what's test worthy is that it's related to immunoglobulin G4, IgG4 apathies. It's an immune mediated disease. So bottom of page 15, wrapping up this SDL, we discussed tumors of the peritoneum. Most of them are malignant and the most common primary malignancy of the peritoneum is mesothelioma, which we have seen in the lungs. The main risk factor is asbestos exposure. Asbestos exposure, yeah, I say that 10 times. And then they really throw us a fastball. Pathologic characteristics of peritoneal mesotheliomas are identical to those of their plural counterpart. Translation, go look in your old SDL if you want to know what this does. So I did go look in the SDL and I can report back that in, if you see a mesothelioma in the peritoneum, it's going to have a sheet-like fibrotic appearance. It's going to be pretty tough or hard um, in terms of density. Um, you may see some calcifications in it. Cytologically, it has either an epithelioid or a sarcomatous histology, although it's possible it be mixed. And so epithelioid, we're thinking like cuboidal or fried egg type cells with big round nuclei in the middle. And then sarcomatous, we're thinking pure spindle cell tumor, and a mesothelioma stains positive for calretinin, keratin-5, and Wilms tumor-1, WT1 protein. And main clinical manifestations of uh, peritoneal mesothelioma, ascites, painful abdominal swelling, weight loss, anorexia. So recognize the stains and uh, Google the cytology if you need a refresher on what a mesothelioma looks like. Primary peritoneal serous carcinoma resembles ovarian carcinoma and this is kind of cheating but we haven't seen ovarian carcinomas yet in our curriculum so i doubt that we'll get asked about this and i personally don't know anything about this and i don't want to go down the 30 minute rabbit hole to look it all up so if one of you would like to then go ahead 
desmoplastic small cell round tumor. I love this one. It tells you exactly what it is. It's a small cell round tumor. And so what other small cell round tumor are we intimate with? Ewing sarcoma, small round blue cells. It has a translocation 1122. Oh, hey, look, same translocation you see in this desmoplastic small cell round tumor. So technically it's a soft tissue sarcoma, meaning it's of mesenchymal origin. It's a connective tissue tumor, malignant tumor too. Sarcoma always means that SAR means it's malignant. And it's got a little bit of a neuroendocrineness to it. So it'll stain with neuronal markers, chromogranin A, synaptophysin, NSE. Uh, so there's like three tumors in this SDL that do stain with those neuronal markers. So I would say keep those separate in your mind. And finally, secondary tumors of the peritoneum. Direct seeding is very common, uh, specifically with organs that perforate easily um, or that are retroperitoneal. Um, the pancreas is partly retroperitoneal, so it could just bop off a tumor that gets stuck on the back of the peritoneum. Um, and ovarian tumors are common and tend to grow on the outside of ovaries. And really no rules to metastatic seeding within the peritoneum. The only way to answer that question is to just know all your different types of primary tumors. And then when they show you a metastasis, you'll be able to identify where it originated from. So that's it for this SDL. I really loved this SDL. I thought it was just uh, well organized, succinct, told me everything I wanted to know about appendicitis and peritonitis. Thank you for spending your time to talk pathology with me.